now we have lined up the discussion around sustain, sustaining market traction for food with climate impact. So if customers preferred food addressing climate change, would they recognize it if it start it stared at them from the shelf? We now have three very well-known entities in our community here that will share their insights. And I'm so honored to moderate this discussion with Ali, Ryan, and also Paul. So let's kick it off. Ali from, from RSF is responsible for identifying mission-aligned businesses throughout the US and deploying intensively structured integrated capital to support their success with a focus on inclusive, resilient food systems and regenerative agriculture. RSF is a known leader in the social enterprise world and invests in food companies that we all care about. Next up, we have Ryan Zinn. Ryan is Dr. Bronner's organic fair trade coordinator, focusing on Dr. Bronner's international supply chain and farmer training. And Ryan has worked in the food and farm justice movement at home and abroad for over 20 years, including organizations such as the Center for International Law, Friends of the Earth Paraguay, Global Exchange, and the Organic Consumer Association. I don't think the brand Dr. Bronner actually needs an introduction. I bet most of you have their products at home in your bathroom. So, and last but not least, farmer and co-owner Paul Moore of Full Belly Farm. Paul, you and your farm are a well-known role model in our community. Full Belly Farm is a 400-acre certified organic farm located in the beautiful Cape Valley of Northern California, north of Sacramento and the Southern Bay Area. Full Belly has, Farm has been used organic practices since 1984 and is certified by California Certified Organic Farmers. So this was a whole lot of introduction here, but I just want to make sure the audience knows what wonderful people we have here with us. So thank you for joining us today. Let's get started. Let's dive into the discussion. So as you know, this event and a significant part of the U.S. population are already converted when it comes to the urgency about climate change. People get care and customers care. So Paul, I want to start with you right from the farm. What is it in your work and production that is different when it comes to soil, carbon, and climate? And everybody else who isn't speaking, maybe put this on mute so we don't have the echo. But again, Paul, over to you. Your work, production, what is different when it comes to soil, carbon, and climate? Well, so, so thank you for having me today. It's just an honor to be here um, speaking with all of you folks here. Um, you know, we've been farming here at Full Belly for about 40 years of farming organically. I grew up on a farm uh, in the Bay Area, um, actually in San Jose. Um, and certainly the patterns in agriculture for the last 100 years have been uh, extractive and, and, and have taken a huge hold on human, human capital in agriculture. People who can afford to farm or remain in agriculture has been diminished incredibly and has created a lot of stress, I think, throughout our country. Um, for, for the last 40 years at Full Belly, we've been focusing on um, a pattern, looking for a pattern of health that link uh, soil, car uh, climate, and carbon. Those are exactly what we've been trying to figure out the last 40 years as organic farmers. Um, the pattern that we've we think about in terms of health and how those are connected is that they're connected through the good food that we grow, through the biodiversity we're able to create on our farm, um, through the human health that results from having products that are um, free from um, pesticides and, and other things that might be harmful. But, but fundamentally, how we, we begin to think about climate, carbon, and our soil health, because soil is, is by far the largest reservoir of carbon on the planet. Um, there's ways as we as farmers can harvest that carbon uh, effectively and put it in the ground to store it there or use it as tissue for plant for plant growth, or use it as root exudates that are fe feeding a myriad of biological life in a soil. So for the past 40 years, we've been focused on how do we as farmers change the di design and pattern that most farmers have engaged in over time um, in order to you know, increase the amount of uh, total life in our system. And that includes certainly soil health. Um, if I might stay, just step back to so everyone kind of understands what farmers fundamentally do, and I've had I heard someone put it in these these words before, and and it were pretty meaningful to me that farmers focus on har harvesting sunlight, and you say well no real farmers focus on harvesting food or making food, but food is is secondary to this whole process of photosynthesis, which is a dynamic process fifty year, billion years old in in the soil 
plant carbon relationship that comes from harvesting that that sunlight and and that that uh, carbon that's harvested in that process through photosynthesis goes into plant tissue and it goes into the soil to feed the, a myriad of, of life there so this is a 50 million year old formula that we participate in and i think as investors you need to be thinking about it. it'll be here 50 million years from now those fundamentals of soil and sunlight and, and living plant tissue and all the, the life that's associated with that will be here 50, 50 million years from, from us. So it's a good investment. I love um, it. It's a pretty stable investment. It's a long-term investment. Cer certainly something that uh, uh, Woody has talked about in, in, in the book about slow money, but it's, it's a very uh, powerful investment. So organic agriculture, since its inception, and we've been an organic farm for those years, um, after leaving uh, my family farm, we decided we wanted to farm organically to deal with some of the issues of, of, of design. Um, we're primarily built, driven by the idea of building soil um, and the, the connection between soil carbon dioxide and, and climate and soil. And there's a direct and measurable relationship. Over these 40 years, our soil um, health has changed. Our soil, um, uh, the amount of carbon in our soil has changed. We have measurable carbon at depth that is greater than some of the natural environments or hedgerows that we're planting. To, be, to create stable environments to grow beneficial insects. But in, in our fields, our soil dip carbon at depth from cover cropping and cropping it continuously and feeding that soil system has actually grown measurably. So again, there's an investment, long-term investment that we're making that's now measurable. We have scientists coming to our farm to measure that and they're being excited by the fact that we can grow more in our fields than we can in stationary areas that are not moved or molested or changed or manipulated a like we do in farming. Okay. Um, so we minimize extraction to create patterns of health, to grow more layers of life here on the farm, and to manage decomposition and carbon accumulation on our farm. Um, so it's a different kind of agriculture. Organic agriculture is different as practiced throughout the country for, by most growers. Um, we think that, that if you look at the organic agriculture movement, it is a great example of how very few people have made significant change in the food system. But it's happened over time. It's happened over 40 years where we've gone from basically our first organizational meetings 40 years ago of how do you uh, create certification? How do you create transparency? How do you create confidence in the consumer? And has been something built over 40 years where now it's a pretty significant structure. And a lot of players are beginning to think about investing in organic agriculture. I so think um, it's, it's a great success a story, but it needs to be accelerated. Absolutely. And okay. I just wanted to point out, there's there. a, I, I don't want to cut you off, but I somehow have to cut you off. I just want to let you know, there's a lot of good comments um, about what you shared in the chat as well. I would actually just pause that for a second. Hold, hold your thoughts. We have some time at the end to kind of dive back there. I'd love to bring Ryan into discussion right now, because now we really looked at the soil and I love your plug investing into the soil. So Ryan, Dr. Bronner's, what approaches that does Dr. Bronner's employer regarding sourcing and production that makes difference in addressing climate issues from your company perspective. Thanks, Angie. And that's a real tough uh, act to follow, Paul. So I will do my best. Um, but uh, yeah, nonetheless, you know, Dr. Bronner started a little over 15 years ago in really building out our own vertically integrated supply chains, because that was one of the few ways we could actually get a real sense of what's happening on the ground and really have an impact. So our really point of departure is working with smallholder farmers all around the world, and we work with some 10,000 smallholder farmers, um, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Pacific. And really our focus has been multifaceted. Really our sort of first entry has been getting farmers within the National Organic Program as a jumping off point. But really the bookend of that is really fair trade. And so when we talk about any type of strategy focusing on regenerative organic agriculture, it is really looking at those two aspects. It's one, soil health. Um, but also the sort of fairness aspect. I, I think we need to really focus on making sure that farmers and farm workers can actually learn a living as they sort of like address the climate crisis, improve soil health and really provide healthy and nutritious uh, products for us. Um, and then secondly, you know, what we've realized over the years to actually get to that point um, as we've moved from organic to fair trade and now to the regenerative organic certification model is really focusing on building both economic development and resilience within our supply chains. Um, and this has been really critical, especially in the last two years as we've seen sort of this dual crisis of both COVID um, and then some really you know, serious climatic disasters impacting our supply chain. So really having those relationships, I think is the greatest pathway to actually have an impact on the ground 
Um, and by doing so, we can actually work with farmers to develop strategies that really address things like resilience and soil health. And that really ranges from, you know, really large scale projects to develop agroforestry programs in a number of countries um, to developing sort of a really soil um, centric strategy in India, for example, where we source all of our mint oil um, that really focuses on really diverse crop rotations, um, building up soil with um, a pretty large compost operation, um, and also providing training and incentives for farmers. So I think it's, it's really tough to really focus on one thing in particular, but I think it's just really kind of a multifaceted approach that can really tackle um, both climate, the plant climate crisis and, and the reality on the ground. Thank you. And thanks for also really putting the farmers into the pictures around like building relationships and working so closely with them. So music to our hearts here. So, I mean, now, given that your products are all deliberately grown and produced to move the lever on climate, how do all the people who care know about this, right? There's a lot happening, but people just don't know about it. So what are you looking for to get the differences across in a very, very noisy and crowded market with the fair share also on greenwashing happening? And Ali, I want to kind of give that first to you because as an investor and underwriter, you have to be worried about if all the great missions of your lenders get traction, you know, how do they keep it? So how are you thinking about this cutting through this noisy, crazy market that's happening and also all the greenwashing? Share some thoughts with us. Great. Thank you. I'd be happy to. So from you know, the financial business analysis perspective, I immediately go to market channels and wanting to understand where consumers are shopping, where is that shelf, right? And um, whether it's traditional grocery, health food stores, farmers markets, delivery services, um, company specific websites, um, I, I am seeing an increasing pattern, I think we all are likely, in, in consumers relearning how to look at products, slowing down the process, turning over the packaging, looking at the ingredients, looking for certification, um, the importance of name recognition that comes through a lot of the work that these entrepreneurs do in publications and conferences, impact initiatives, websites, really educating consumers. Um, and, you know, kind of drilling down a little bit into my role in it, I'm looking for measurable impact. So it's, it's very easy to make grand overarching statements about things that an organization cares about, but are they actually measuring that? And are they looking at the right impact objectives? Um, and increasingly, you know, we're all uh, desktop detectives, I think, you know, we're spending so much time at our desktops. Consumers have a lot more access to information and due diligence, and a website is essentially a storefront for, for entities. So. Um, you know, it, in, in a, it, it's important for organizations to be making the best case scenario, making it count and tracking their impact and effectively communicating it. Um, so a, a little bit more detail, you know, from the lender perspective, I, my, one of my responsibilities is intuitively assessing the area of biggest impact. So whether that's water, energy, soil, staff, consumer and community health. Um, in addition to assessing baseline financial, operational, strategic strength and resiliency measures. Um, I'll give an example, right? We, we're in an era of volatility and utility expenses. Um, so renewable sourcing mitigates that effect on an operating expense bottom line perspective. Um, or on an agricultural production, I'm looking at, are they working with the local regional um, uh, resource conservation districts to manage irrigation precision, to reduce water runoff, um, watershed toxicity, soil preservation, um, and investing into next year's crop. Um, and measures like that are attainable because you don't have to be a landowner. You can, a lot of farmers that um, I've worked with in the past are not able to be landowners. Um, so there are um, practices that are available to smaller scale entrepreneurs. Wow, super helpful. Thanks so much, Ellie. Um, I actually want to bring it back now to, to Paul. Paul, let's get you again into the discussion as well. Like any points you wanted to share, but also really around, you know, how do you raise awareness and how can you align also with your peer, you know, peer community to amplify the voices? I know you have been into the organic certification space for a long, long time. So how do you raise awareness, Paul? Share with us your wisdom. Well, you know, so the, the marketplace has to be built on some kind of confidence that, that what folks are getting and what they believe they're getting is, is true. So certification is important. Um, we, 
been uh, part of CCUF for years. We um, have, are part of the Real Organic Project now, which is looking to um, right the ship of the, the USDA has kind of set a, set a second course where the hydroponic uh, soilless organic is being um, allowed to be certified. Um, farms that are growing livestock are not adhering to pasture rules. So we're trying to right the, um, the, the, the record so that the confidence consumers have and, and the transparency needed to make the food system clearly the value that they're they're paying for is there so that's that's one thing but they, you know the all the all the pieces just fit together um, in, in, in a very complex way. Um, we have an initiative here in the Valley where we're looking at changing land ownership. So the land is, is secured by a community group that, that owns the land and takes it off the market and puts farmers on there who need to be on there. So we're trying to solve the land access issue as a very important thing. The, the issue of fairness becomes something that we can talk a lot to our uh, end users. Uh, we can do it a lot easier if we're doing a farmer's market or um, at, on a regional market market level, but it's harder to do when you're in the wholesale market. Um, so there, we need people like Ali to creating the, the matrices where uh, measurable outcomes can be um, shared with um, uh, people throughout the food chain where there's value attached to those. There's um, really, it's a value proposition that has to be information rich, and we try and share as much information as possible. Um, and where you you have um, a director relationship, we actually bring people to the farm here because there's no substitute for people putting their their feet on the farm. So thinking nationally, acting locally is really, really, really critical to making this thing uh, continue on the trajectory it's on and improve it. Absolutely agree here. And I would say, Ryan, that's a good place to bring you back in as well. So. How does Dr. Bronner's cut through the market noise? How does Dr. Bronner's create awareness for consumers looking to make a choice? Also, maybe for about, example, about chocolate, because everybody knows you for other products. So tell us a little about it. How do you cut through the noise? Yeah, that, that's a good question. You know, in our particular case, you know, we've kind of done a two pronged approach. One, you know, we have our sort of annual report, our, our all one report where we really talk about the metrics. Certainly that is a important element for some people, you know, that are looking to sort of differentiate themselves. And certainly we try to provide that information as well. Um, but really, you know, we try to let the product itself do much of the communication. So um, Dr. Brown has just recently launched a chocolate line, which has been a uh, couple of year in the making process and a fun uh, learning experience for sure. But really our goal was to figure out how do we um, take all of this great uh, production that many of our farmer partners are doing and then be able to create a new product and, and have that story um, be told to the product. So really it gives us an opportunity to talk about things that both are on the plus side, you know, regenerative organic agriculture, for example, and then all of the elements that go into creating really resilient or regenerative systems, but also talk about what we are actually actively addressing, you know, things like child labor in West Africa, for example, um, certainly the efforts to really replant diverse agroforestry systems and change agricultural landscapes. And so that is something that the product itself can do. And I think that's one way to actually educate um, you know, consumers to go beyond just looking for a random label, but really have a much more, I would say, intimate connection with the product and the project itself. Mm -hmm. And since I have a sweet tooth, I want to come back to that chocolate question, because I know you, you're collaborating with Alter Eco, which a lot of people were saying like, well, this is a competitor. So tell us a little bit more about, you know, what kind of collaborations are needed in this space to really make sure we, you know, we support our climate and we keep Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I will say really, you know, for those of us, particularly in the international space, you know, in terms of sourcing, that collaboration is absolutely critical. And so, um, you know, my colleague and I are actually on the Alter Eco Foundation um, board, and that has been a great way for us to be able to collaborate and figure out actually how to scale this out in a meaningful way. Um, to be honest with you, we're a, a small niche within a niche, and if we're gonna actually move the needle and have a big impact on the ground, uh, we need to collaborate. And so it's been great to be able to work with other like-minded companies um, and to be able to focus on creating a strategy that both educates consumers, but actually, actually has impact on the ground. And that's really been really our focus. So it's great to be able to work with like-minded companies like, like Alter Eco. That's super helpful. Ellie, any final thoughts from your end? What do you want consumers to know? What do you want investors to take away? No pressure, huh? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I welcome it. Um, I, I just think this is a very exciting space to be in. I know I'm preaching to the choir being in the room that we're in right now, but there's really vast opportunity for organizations and business leaders that are showing up authentically or holding themselves accountable and um, 
And I think it's on all of us as well to do our part to continue to educate consumers. I, I do think that a lot of people in this field are, are cultural catalysts or are in the position to become cultural catalysts and influence others. Um, so just I'm, I'm grateful for everyone's work in this field and, and I'm, I'm grateful for this, this space. So thank you for including us. Thank you. Absolutely. And I would say just gratefulness right back at you all. Please join me in a virtual applause wherever you are. Thank you to the three of you for, you know, just kind of bringing the topics into the front and center.